Just a little video there, of course, on Constantine the Great, uh, of course, one of the first Christian Roman emperors, of course. That would be, by the way, the founder of the Byzantine, Byzantine Empire, of course, which I'll be, of course, talking a little bit about today. So anyway, I want to welcome you back to History 1113. This is Daniel Simon, of course, at Baton Rouge Community College. I uh, hope you're doing great out there, of course, uh, today. But uh, anyway, uh, of course, uh, before we get started, it looks like I do have a few students watching live right now. Um, I've got Ashley. Hey, what's going on on YouTube? Uh, Drake, Drake, what's going on this morning? Hope you're doing great out there. Uh, Shelby, uh, uh, also uh, Jazel. Hey, good morning. Hope you're doing great uh, pretty much. So anyway, uh, before I get started this morning, uh, lecture-wise, uh, of course, a um, few reminders, uh, of course, about the week uh, in general. Uh, don't forget, you know, last weekend we had the, um, I think we had the book reports due. Uh, that last third uh, vocab was also due. So, you know, if anybody's like behind on great, uh, you know, getting that done, let me know about that. Probably should be able to give you some credit on that. Uh, so if you haven't completed it. Hey, Matthew, good morning. Hope you're doing great uh, overall. Uh, but uh, yeah, that, and of course, I did have like some new assignments I posted. Uh, of course, uh, I've got the, uh, of course, the, there's a new one on the uh, later Roman Empire Canvas quiz uh, that needs to be, of course, completed. That's like the last really quiz I'm going to give you before the final, uh, which will be due at the end of next week, the last week of classes. Uh, there's also one still up right now. Uh, I think due, I think I'm moving up to Friday is when it'll be due uh, this week, but that's on the early Roman uh, Roman history quiz number six, I think it is. That's also up uh, as well. So I think that's pretty much it uh, for announcements right now. Uh, I think you do have like uh, the, uh, there's like another vocab I put up, which will be due at the end of the semester. But I did want to mention about uh, if there's any students out there uh, that are doing the Veterans Project, that oral history project, uh, that is going to be due uh, on May 1st. I think that's going to be, I think, the last due date I'll kind of give you, at least during like close to finals, I guess I'll maybe let you kind of turn it in. But that's, if you're doing that, you need to kind of wrap up that soon and, and turn that into me. All right. So uh, anyway, today, um, uh, today's lecture, I'm going to mostly concentrate on the Middle Ages. That's pretty much what this lecture is about. Uh, mostly the early, early Middle Ages we'll get into uh, today. I'll talk about the development of the Byzantine Empire, which is kind of around in the Middle Ages, you know, for a while uh, that they have. Uh, it's also called the Eastern Roman Empire. I'll also talk about a little bit, just a few minutes, also on the rise of Islam, because Islam is one of the things that kind of kills the Byzantine Empire later, kills it off pretty much. Uh, then I'll get into the rise of the Franks, uh, who take over part of most of Western Central Europe. So we'll get into them uh, as well. Uh, if you have any comments, questions, of course, in this lecture, let me know, like during the live stream, of course, or later you can you know send me any kind of comments, questions you, you want uh, about. Uh, this lecture or previous lectures, of course, that I had before. Hey, Amber, what's going on? Hope you're having a great morning out there. Uh, Bob Way, so if you're doing good. Uh, also, Maya, hey, what's up? What's going on? Uh, also, as well. So, everybody's doing great out there uh, overall. So, uh, anyway, uh, like I said, I'm, of course, Ted, today I'm going to, of course, talk about. Uh, the Byzantine Empire first, which uh, it's, of course, got different names uh, that they call it. And people often call it the uh, other name that they have for it, uh, of course, uh, which is the uh, East. They call it the Eastern Roman Empire uh, as well. That's, the, of course, the usual name they called it. And I'll kind of explain why they call it Byzantine. People say Byzantine. It's pronounced different ways. Uh, some people all say uh, Byzantium. I'll say it that way. Uh, also as well. But you can see it's an empire that was around a while. They're talking about like another thousand years. It's kind of around uh, from the fourth century uh, up to the fifth, 15th century, but it's not really that, uh, it's not really much of an empire later. I think up to like Justinian's time, Emperor Justinian around the sixth century, it's pretty large size, but over time it shrinks. It's not very big uh, in size, but they do think it heavily influenced the world. A lot of people, especially in the West, uh, in Mediterranean region, uh, and um, it lasted a long time. It was, I guess, as a, as a state or whatever, like you know, this so-called state lasted over a thousand years, like eleven or twenty-three years, I guess, if you want to put it from when Constantine 
founded Constantinople up to its collapse, 1453, when it was conquered by the Ottoman Empire. Uh, that's about that's about how many years it was around at one point. Uh, it had an influence on Russia, like the Russians later. I don't know about the Russian Empire, but the Russians got the idea of the czars uh, from the, the Byzantine Caesars that, that reigned as emperors. So it's the name. And I think I think the Russians wanted to make Moscow later, like the third round. That's one of the things that they sometimes talk about uh, more or less. A uh, little background on the Byzantines. Uh, it was like it was like another. It was a version of the Roman Empire, but it was more like this Eastern version uh, that was like a, it was influenced by Greek culture a lot. Uh, but it was, of course, a Christian state. That's one thing I guess that's kind of unique uh, about the Byzantine Empire. In fact, that in fact, it was really considered one of the first really uh, Christian empires that that's around. Uh, that's you know all Christian. That became the pretty much the official state religion uh, that they had uh, with the with the empire. And um, anyway, um, of course, well, I think we've talked about this before uh, about the about the Byzantine Empire. Uh, but of course, it had a capital, uh, which I think we've talked about before, uh, which was known as Constantinople, the one that was found by Constantine the Great uh, in the year three thirty. Uh, so. Um, it's now part of like the Republic of Turkey today. You know, it's called Istanbul, the modern name. I'll kind of explain why it's called that later. Or I, mean, I think I already kind of mentioned that already. I think about it. I think previously in the previous lecture, I thought. Uh, and um, but it's yeah, part of like Republic of Turkey now. Uh, but it's actually located on the European side, uh, kind of south of the Black Sea, like I talked about before. Uh, so it's actually more towards like close to where Thrace used to be. You know like in that northern northern Aegean coast and all that. And, uh, and of course, a religion, I think we mentioned about this before, about the fact that the, you know, going back to Constantine, uh, the religion that eventually developed in the East that became the official state church uh, was the Orthodox faith, Eastern Orthodox, Greek Orthodox. It's called different names, of course. Usually called the Eastern Orthodox Church, I think is the official name, or some people call the Eastern Catholic Church. I think is a kind of a variation that they called it as well. Uh, and uh, the uh, this Byzantine Church, you know, uh, would have a religious leader uh, that was later called the Patriarch. Although he started, at, I think his his title originally was called Bishop of Constantinople, but they use the term Patriarch uh, instead, which is still the I think one of the high religious figures uh, of that modern church today that they have. So, so anyway, uh, here's kind of like uh, some little slide, of course, on uh, the Byzantine Empire. Uh, you know, uh, one thing that's very famous, you know, about the Byzantine Empire, uh, they adopted the symbol, uh, which of course was the double-headed eagle, which you can which you can see there. And of course, it's been used by a lot of states. I think Germany used it at one point. Austria, Hungary, and Europe. Uh, the Russian Empire used it, like the Romanov dynasty, I think, adopted it later. And uh, it symbolized the fact that the uh, Byzantine Empire was basically uh, based in part of the East and the West, because uh, I think it was based in part of Europe originally, and then part of it was based in, like, Asia, you know, or some or part of Africa as well, I guess. But that's kind of why I think it's, they use that symbol for it. It was kind of going two different directions. And um, they called it different names. Uh, the, the common name uh, that they called it themselves was either like Roman was a term they used for themselves or Romania, I think was the common names that, that you'll often see, you can see there. But the terms like Byzantine and Byzantium, uh, those are later names that were adopted uh, that were used more like by historians and all that. And um it, I'll get I'll get to it in a little later, but it has to do. I think I mentioned this before about the fact that the city of Constantinople was built on an old Greek city that was called Byzantium or Byzantium, and so hence the name sometimes being used later uh, because of that. Uh, by the way, Constantinople was heavily built on a it was it was it was built on this heavy you know fortified type peninsula. That's one thing it's kind of known for. Uh, I think I've got some pictures showing the, where the peninsula is. It's kind of seeing this map right here. Uh, and um, it, um, 
can see it right there. It's kind of like it's right south of the Black Sea. You can see Nicomedia where uh, supposedly um, Constantine died right here. Of course, you see also Nicaea, of course, where the Council of Nicaea met. See, all these sites are here, right here close to the Black Sea. Uh, but you can see uh, Constantine was kind of built on the other European side, uh, basically. And so heavily fortified right here. They built that in that location on purpose uh, because uh, they could fortify it, fortify it easily on, on its western approach, like over here. Uh, and then um, and I think also I think I mentioned how a lot of the trade routes were kind of running through that area right there in uh, the, the famous uh, Theodosian walls uh, were later built uh, in the 5th century. Uh, these are like these heavily fortified walls that were like, I think they're like about 50, 60 feet tall in some places. Uh, and uh, they were built to protect the Byzantine Empire's capital from various barbarians attacking them. Like I think the Goths and I think later the Huns and all that. And so Constantinople was very hard to to really breach their walls. I think I think in its history they were only breached like I want to say twice, uh, which was during the Crusades, the so-called Fourth Crusade. I think around it was the twelve oh four, I think it was, or something like that. And it also when the Ottoman Empire conquered it in fourteen fifty three. So it's very difficult to break into uh, Constantinople. They also had a pretty good naval power uh, as well. Uh, the Byzantines for a while, which kind of gave them an edge. And uh, they had the secret weapon they were known for, which was called Greek fire, which was kind of like napalm that they would shoot at people and basically burn their ships up and men. Uh, now I'll get into and talk about the peak of the um, Byzantine Empire, which uh, it peaks around the uh, reign of Emperor Justinian. Like sixth century is usually when it peaks as a power. And then after that, it kind of starts shrinking uh, in the Middle Ages. And, uh, of course, the greatest emperor that they had of the Byzantine Empire was Justinian, uh, who reigned uh, in, in the 6th century. Uh, and uh, he was called Justinian I, or also known as Justinian the Great. Uh, he was part of a dynasty of, um, of Roman emperors that were called the uh, Justinian Dynasty. I think it was related to like one of his uncles named Justin, who was an emperor before him. And um, anyway, uh, I'll get to Justinian later. He actually uh, is famous for trying to reconquer the West, trying to expand the empire. And it, the size of the empire kind of peaks under his reign. And then after that, it, of course, will, will shrink. It won't be as large, uh, more or less. Uh, where we get most of our historical information on um, the period of Justinian, well, there's a, there was a um, famous uh, historian named Procopius uh, who lived about the same time uh, as, as Emperor Justinian did. So it's called Procopius of Caesarea, uh, and uh, he wrote like something like three different works at one point about Justinian's reign. Wars of Justinian, the buildings of Justinian, uh, the secret history, which is kind of one of the interesting ones that he wrote uh, and all that. And uh, he gives a lot of history of Justinian's reign. He, he actually claims that Justinian was a like, very ruthless ruler. Uh, that a lot of people hated him, uh, but uh, he is considered to be one of the greatest rulers uh, that they had uh, overall. I'll get to later some of his reforms he was kind of known for, uh, Justinian. Uh, but he had this one book called The Secret History where he kind of outlined like some of the things about Justinian that were kind of covered up, you know, about his life. And he also talks about a lot of the uh, expansionism under uh, Justinian, all the different wars uh, where he fought different barbarian powers like the Goths and Goths and Vandals and so on. Uh, and um, anyway, um, one, one of the most famous things that, uh, Justinian was known for uh, was his, like I said, his expansionism. I think I've got a map showing you under his reign, but under his reign, the uh, Byzantine Empire would actually reconquer the West, like parts of it. You can see they would actually take over at one point the area where Carthage used to be. They would actually seize it uh, from the, uh, what is the so-called Vandals. He actually destroyed the Vandalic Kingdom, which was uh, right here. Uh, then he also, into what is part of the kingdom of the Visigoths, he took that back 
um, also as well. Uh, you can see that. Uh, and, um, and I think against the Ostrogoths, he also took back Italy. And part of why Rome was kind of in ruins later uh, was because of all these so-called Gothic wars uh, that he fought. And uh, there was a Byzantine general that was very famous uh, that was under him. He was named Belisarius. You may have heard of him. He was like one of the last great Roman generals uh, in Roman history that they really write about. And he was one of the main men that really helped reconquer the West, which a lot of the reconquests of the West uh, took place in like a 15, 20 year period uh, between about the 530s to about the 540s. So that's how long it took them basically uh, to do it. And Procopius, uh, you know, wrote a lot of history about Belisarius. Uh, he even went on, I think, some of the campaigns with them uh, in all that. So Belisarius is pretty important you know, as a figure uh, that dealt with, you know, that period. So, yeah, some of the history of, of, of Justinian. Uh, but, um, oh, Justinian was also famous because um, you can see the years he reigned, 527 to 565. It's an interesting figure. Uh, Justinian, um, they consider him to be one of the last Romans. I think it's one of the nicknames that they sometimes call him. Uh, and uh, he's one of the last traditional Romans that could actually speak Latin. Because uh, if you know about the East, like the Byzantine Empire, pretty much the main language uh, became Greek. You know, because in the West they spoke Latin. Uh, and so he's like one of the very few that actually can knows the old Latin languages and things like that. So uh, Justin, he was uh, very famous uh, for his wife, uh, who, of course, you may have heard of named Empress Theodora, uh, who's kind of got a colorful past. Uh, she was, I, don't know, I think she was an ex-circus performer that may have been a prostitute or something like that, I've heard. Uh, and uh, she became very, very powerful. Procopius talks a lot about her. She was kind of ruthless, too. Uh, but they think she was the one uh, that was really the um, balls behind the <laughs> behind the throne of, of Justinian. Uh, and um, she was like basically one of Justinian's like chief advisors, so highly influential. Uh, so she's considered like one of the most influential uh, empress consorts of like Roman emperors. Uh, I think I think I think of that one, maybe Julia Domna, maybe or some Timia Severus or something like that uh, in the past. But she's definitely considered, of course, uh, that. Uh, now, some things that Justinian, of course, are kind of known for. Uh, Justinian is very famous for his Justinian Code. You probably heard about that, which was a series of legal reforms that were done uh, throughout the Byzantine Empire in the sixth century. Uh, he had a bunch of like. Uh, jurists that developed this particular code. It's actually called the Code of Justinian, as I use it, what they call it, or Codex Justinian, I think is the actual name they called it. Uh, but in modern times, they started calling it Corpus Juris Civilis, which means body of civil law. Uh, and uh, what they did was they went back and they codified mostly a bunch of Roman laws that went back to the period of the five good emperors. Uh, like the second century, roughly. It was composed of like something like 5,000 laws almost uh, that were in it. Uh, and um, uh, the term code, by the way, if you ever wonder whether these were code or the word codex, uh, a codex was like a wooden tablet. Because uh, one thing about the uh, Byzantine Empire, they started writing things in manuscript, manuscripts and you know, actually creating what they call books, because, uh, you know, before that, the Greeks and the Romans had used like scrolls uh, before that. And so that's where you get the word code from, from the word codex, uh, which is like a tablet, a manuscript tablet. Uh, it did have other sections to it. Uh, I, think, I think there's some other ones called the Digest, the Inst Institutes, and also one called the Novella. Uh, they were part of it as well, because they had like parts of it, which were, I think they had like the Digest was like 50 volumes of like, summaries of various opinions of legal writers and things like that uh, that they had. They actually had the Institutes, which is like a textbook on how to read the code. Uh, and then they had the Novella, which was like a series of um, new laws that were created after the code was created. And that's where you get the word novel from, Novella, originally, N-O-V-E-L-L-A-E, -L -L -E, or something like that. 
but the code the code was highly influential. It it heavily influenced like Napoleon to come up with the uh, his so-called Napoleonic code in the early 1800s, and uh, it's something that's kind of round today that's still pretty much influential overall. Uh, other things I want to talk about uh, the city of um, of uh, Constantinople are some of the sites that were, of course, well known uh, in the city. Which some of these are not around anymore, except for the Hagia Sophia. But uh, they had what they call the Great Palace. The Great Palace was this uh, ancient palace uh, that was built by the Byzantine emperors that went back to the fourth century. They, th they think it was built originally by Constantine the Great and was expanded over time. And so there it is right there. Uh, you can see, uh, and next to it was the Hippodrome. The Hippodrome was the famous Byzantine racetrack uh, that they had. And the racetrack um, was basically where they had chariot racing. Chariot racing was really popular uh, in the Byzantine world, just like it was in the Roman Empire in the West, like in Rome uh, and all that. And it's not as big. I think the Pippodrome, I want to say was, uh, I don't know, I think it was like a quarter of the size of what the Circus Maximus was, basically, but it doesn't exist anymore. It was torn down, and they, they're not sure, I forget who exactly built it, but it was built before the time of of maybe Justinian's reign, probably going back to Constantine when I think they first built it originally. Uh, and then the Hagia Sophia, of course, one of the most famous, of course, uh, in, in that you've, of course, heard about, uh, which is right there on that picture, um, was a famous uh, church, uh, cathedral that was built, of course, uh, by the Emperor Justinian uh, during his reign. It was actually built a couple times because uh, I think it collapsed, uh, supposedly. And it was known for its uh, large-sized dome, uh, by the way, uh, that he that was built with. It's one, had one of the largest domes in the world uh, at one point, uh, which um, I believe the size of the dome is about 240 feet wide. It was pretty, pretty large. And it was like basically the headquarters, I guess, of the whole Orthodox Church, you know, where the patriarch, you know, ruled from, I guess, as the actual uh, religious leader. And so it was basically the, the, the they had like several, like they, they got the Blue Mosque, which I think is nearby, which was also another uh, church that was there they built as well. Uh, I, think, I think it may have been built by him as well, Justinian, but um, over time, it became a mosque, as you know, uh, when the Ottoman Empire conquered, you know, the Byzantine Empire, which I think for a long time was actually a, a museum. And then I think very controversially, if you, there's a big thing that came out controversially, like I think just recently, where uh, the leader of, of of Turkey decided to turn it back into a mosque. So that's kind of a big controversy, you know, about that, because some see it as a church and then some see it as a mosque. You know, that, that's kind of a debate about that. And you can see the minarets that were added to it, like all those four, those little things coming up that are kind of next to it. Uh, those are all minarets that they kind of added later. Uh, they were kind of there, which to call Muslims the prayer and all that, you know, in, in what is uh, Istanbul. So I think I mentioned why they call it Istanbul. I think I told you because uh, the fact that in, in the old days they used to, joke about the fact that it was the only city that was there, the big city, major city. So they call it, let's go to the city, they would say. And so it's like the Turkish variation of that, Istanbul uh, is where that comes from. So uh, anyway, it's kind of some history, you know, dealing with, you know, the Byzantine Empire. But yeah, they would decline, though. That's the only thing about uh, it. Over time, over time, what happened to the uh, Byzantine Empire, it would shrink. Uh, it mostly, uh, most of the Byzantine Empire, at least throughout the Middle Ages, uh, is based around like Turkey and Greece. That, that's about it. Uh, the area that, because I think I've got that map showing you uh, previously, uh, the area that it was in, uh, the Byzantine Empire. But over time, uh, what's going to happen, uh, of course, it, it'll shrink. It'll basically, you know, this map here, um, most of the air, like around really this area here, like from like the part of Greece and maybe Western Turkey, uh, they'll be in this area, but they lose a lot of territory. Uh, like in the West, uh, a lot of the territory here was lost to the different Germanic peoples uh, that were over here. Mm -hmm. And then most then from Turkey to the Middle East, like from here to here, most of that territory 
will be lost to Islam. Islam is going to come in, uh, and they're basically going to, yeah, really the rise of Islam has a lot to do with why, you know, the Byzantine Empire eventually fell apart and collapsed because uh, they, they just couldn't handle that. They also had other, like, Persian, they had a Persian Empire in the East, uh, I think, that also came about, too, the Sassanids and all that. That was kind of an issue uh, as well. So all these different groups uh, came in. And uh, they also talk about the fact that uh, under Justinian, uh, they had this thing in the 540s that was called the Plague of Justinian, where they had this massive outbreak of bubonic plague uh, that occurred uh, in about the mid-6th century. And they think that helped co to contribute to why the Byzantine Empire kind of started declining later because of population issues uh, as well. I guess I'll mention the Nike the Nike revolt or riots that were kind of famous. Uh, I'll mention briefly, but 532. But uh, there was this deal where uh, a, a actual riot broke out uh, in Constantinople uh, under Justinian's reign, and uh, it started the Hippodrome. You know, like, like a lot of the chariot races, like were real popular, and it was like um, almost like uh, gangs or something like that. They, they had street gangs or political parties. They were broken up into different groups. Like there was one like the blues and the greens and the reds. I think they had, and it's kind of weird. Uh, and anyway, a big, big riot broke out uh, and ended up burning down the city. Uh, and so he had to rebuild a lot of it. That's why the Hagia Sophia was built, I think, multiple times because it burned down. Uh, and um, he actually had to go in and literally put it down, massacre all the people that were in the riot. Uh, and they think mostly because of the fact that his wife was the one that egged him on to do it. So he was ruthless, uh, Justinian, but uh, I think later rulers are just weaker uh, that come in later. And then you've got all these external threats, of course, that, that are out there. That's the reason for you know that. All right. I want to get next into for a few minutes and just talk about uh, as well. Of course, there's the another picture of the code. Uh, right there. But I want to talk about the rise of Islam for a little bit today. That's another topic, of course, that comes in as well uh, that you have. And you can see Islam uh, was a new religion. It was a monotheistic religion uh, that developed in the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, and it was founded by the prophet Muhammad. Uh, Muhammad was this um, Meccan. Um, he's from Mecca. He was a merchant. Uh, and anyway, uh, he started a new religion. Uh, in, I guess, at the turn of the uh, seventh century, uh, from revelations that he got from, I think, an angel, which was, uh, I think, Gabriel. And uh, from there uh, in Mecca, he started his religion, but uh, a lot of the people, the Arab people, did not trust him. Because, uh, you know, at the time, the Arabs were primarily polytheistic. Uh, they worshiped these gods, I think they were called jinn spirits, which they had several hundred. Uh, that they had, which they worship supposedly in that Kaaba that's famous, you know, in Mecca now. Uh, and, um, and so he had to flee, so-called Hydra, where uh, Muhammad fled to Medina. And Medina, actually, north of Mecca in Saudi Arabia, is really where Islam began as a religion uh, from there. And then later he would retake, you know, Mecca. Uh, and then after that, after, you know, by the time, of, I think, the death of Muhammad, uh, he started to see Islam start to take over uh, most of the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, and so, so that was the initial uh, beginning beginning of Muhammad. Here's the years of Muhammad, by the way, when he lived, 570 to 632 uh, CE. So he's considered the greatest prophet, you know, uh, to, to Islam, uh, like an Arab prophet. Uh, and uh, he's supposed to be like this prophet that followed, you know, uh, Moses and Jesus, you know, to, to Muslims today, uh, more or less. But yeah, those cities, Mecca, Medina, of course, the two holiest sites, really. You know, I think after that, you have Jerusalem that's real big, too, uh, as well. And uh, most, most of the religion will be based on a lot of the teachings of Muhammad, uh, which, you know, will be put down later, written down uh, in what is the Quran, Quran uh, so-called holy book, in, of course, in Islam. It was originally written in Arabic and, of course, now written in all kinds of languages, of course, today. Uh, and that's one thing that really helped to really spread the religion, the fact that the Arabs kind of spoke a common language, uh, more or less. By the way, the, uh, the name Islam, by the way, it means in Arabic submission or to submit to God or surrender to God uh, is what the name means. 
And in the name, uh, the, uh, the, the word Muslim means surrendering ones or, sub, or submissive ones uh, also as well, which in, in uh, they use the word Allah, you know, as you know, for the word God, uh, which means really God, basically in English, more or less. So, uh, yeah, from so you got that at that point going on with Muhammad. You know, he, after his death, uh, what happened next was that then uh, Islam then spread. It didn't stay in you know, the Arabian Peninsula, like starting basically uh, in the 7th and 8th centuries. It spread throughout the, the Middle East. It went into like North Africa. Uh, it went uh, also into Spain briefly for a little bit uh, as well. And then you can say it went eastward. You can see all the way into Turkey. It went to Iraq, went to Iran, it went to Afghanistan, uh, even got into Eastern Europe at one point. So it went all over the place, uh, Islam. Uh, and I got a map showing you kind of uh, kind of the spread of Islam. You can see it kind of spread over like a long period of time, you know, from 7th century up through like the 10th, 11th century. And you can see where it's going like west versus going east. Uh, right there. So yeah, initially you can see Muhammad starts it, you know, pretty much right here. Uh, then it goes into Egypt and Syria first, uh, then into the western part of North Africa. So Libya, uh, uh, Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco, Spain here, uh, up into, of course, you can see it kind of gets up in here, eventually in Eastern Europe. It's all this area right here, believe it or not. And it does actually push up into like at one point, uh, parts of like close to where Yugoslavia is. You, you've got a lot of people that are Muslim that are close to like around where Croatia is in Serbia. So up in here, right there, uh, pushing all the way into, of course, Iraq, Persia. You can see it does reach into India. Pakistan, you know, has got a, a lot of people that are Muslim uh, as well, even pushes into the Indian Ocean uh, at one point. So it's all throughout uh, those regions uh, that you're you're kind of looking at. Uh, more or less. Um, oh, also, yeah, some of the people that hell, I kind of mentioned briefly about this while I'm at it, but after Muhammad died, uh, they had these uh, successors that came in uh, that were kind of somehow related to Muhammad or knew Muhammad. Uh, Abu Baker, uh, Umar, usually sometimes called Omar uh, as well. Uh, Uthman uh, was another one who was also famous uh, as well. Uh, Ali uh, was another one as well. So they, they helped also spread uh, Islam uh, as well. Uh, and um, I think most of them were not related except for Ali, who was like a cousin of Muhammad. Uh, the only thing about Ali was that Ali kind of was, you know, I think after the death of Ali, there was kind of this issue where um, Islam split, you know, about this uh, into two different religious sects, which is known for today. Uh, which the Sunni are majority, like 80, 90 percent, pretty much. Um, and then the rest are Shiite, Shiite Muslims or Shia Muslims, uh, which uh, the Shia are mostly like around like um, Iraq, Iran, Syria. That's where they are. Uh, but majority of Muslims today in the whole world, you know, around, all around the world, you know, majority Sunni, uh, more or less. Uh, in Islam, they also have the so-called five pillars. I guess I'll mention about the five pillars of faith. That's something that's real big uh, Islam uh, today, which faith, first one, of course, you probably heard about, uh, which is, of course, the whole belief that you have to believe in Muhammad, uh, that he's the main prophet uh, overall prayer, uh, usually five times a day, traditional Muslims, of course. So it's usually facing towards Mecca, of course. Almsgiving, where you have to give money to the poor, uh, help people out uh, for fasting, especially around Ramadan. Uh, and then uh, the Hajj. Hajj is something that uh, a lot of Muslims try to do uh, where they make a pilgrimage to, to Mecca, Medina, uh, where, you know, the footsteps of Muhammad uh, and all that. Uh, there's also famous mosques that, of course, that's basically the religious sanctuary, you know, of Muslims today, uh, which, of course, the most sacred one is where the Kaaba is, which is the so-called they usually call it the Grand Mosque, the common name uh, they, of course, call it today. Uh, a lot of Muslims believe that the Kaaba was originally built by uh, Abraham or Ibrahim, as they, as they say, a long time ago, uh, and his son, Isaac. Well, that's the theory anyway, a long, long time ago. Uh, and uh, I think that's where they had idols in there at one point. But the only thing that's part of it is now the Black Stone of Mecca, 
uh, which I think is uh, some kind of meteorite that uh, fell from Earth that's kind of broken up now. And so many people touched it, it turned black, apparently. But it's kind of in the only, only idol that's left from, I guess, previously that was there a long time ago. So they have that one. There's other mosques, too. Like they've got the um, Prophet's Mosque in Medina, where Muhammad's actually buried uh, in inside of it. Uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque and Mosque uh, in Jerusalem is also pretty big. They also have this thing called the Dome of the Rock, uh, you may have heard of, which is a very famous Islamic shrine uh, that's there. In uh, There's a belief that supposedly Muhammad uh, died uh, and his soul descended from heaven uh, from that site uh, where the um, Dome of the Rock is. Uh, it's built, built uh, where the old temple was in Jerusalem. Uh, and I think it was also the site where the, uh, I'll get to it later, where the um, Templars had their headquarters, like the Knights Templar, suppose they ruled from there at one point or something like that. But it's one of the oldest surviving Islamic sanctuaries really in the world. Uh, that's why it's such a big deal, I guess. Uh, it's the holy site after the ones in Mecca and Medina. So those are the top three. And I think Al-Aqsa Mosque, I think, is the fourth holiest one, you know, that they had. Uh, Jews consider that the holy site, too. You know about that on the Temple Mount because uh, they think that's where supposedly, um, at least the story about it, is that where Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac. Uh, you know the story about that. Uh, but he saw a ram, and so he sacrificed the ram instead. So I don't know. That's why it's a holy site, uh, maybe. At least that's the theory about that. I've heard one one story. Another theory is that also that it might have been the site where um, the um, so-called uh, Ten Commandments was kept. The Ark of the Covenant, right there on that site, maybe I don't know. Anyway, but um, anyway, uh, kind of moving on. Of course, uh, talk about uh, I need to get into uh, as well. But uh, we need to talk about also uh, what happens, of course, with the early Middle Ages. Uh, I haven't really got into and talked about like what the Middle Ages were, like the background uh, of it, and. Um, yeah, the Middle Ages, um, you have this period in, in Europe where after the Roman Empire collapsed uh, around the 5th century, you get this new historical period that comes in, which is called usually the Middle Ages or uh, the Medieval Period. or mid They also call it the Medieval Times. It's called all kinds of names uh, that they dub it. And uh, the term Middle Ages uh, comes from different... Um, uh, like origins. Uh, usually it actually came from really the word uh, medium evum, uh, which uh, was an old Latin term that they used back in the Middle Ages, uh, which meant Middle Age. And then I think in England a long time ago, uh, there was an old English term, which was a variation of medium evum, which was medieval. It was probably medieval or something like that, kind of slurred it together. And it became like one word. And so medieval meant middle age. Uh, and uh, we're talking about a period, by the way, which was like uh, a period from like the beginning when the Western Roman Empire fell. And it goes all the way up to the Renaissance period. Uh, so you're like around thousand years. It's about the time period of the Middle Ages. Uh, and although the dates are kind of debated, you know, I've got I've got it rounded off. You can see 500 to 1500 is usually the period that they usually refer to as being called the Middle Ages. Uh, but a lot of historians think the Middle Ages started before that. You can go back to the time of Constantine the Great. Uh, you can even go back to the period of the um, that crisis period, the third century, when the Roman Empire was starting to kind of decline. Some people think that's when the Middle Ages actually started. So. A lot of people think it was started when the uh, barbarians started invading Europe and all that, and so you start you get a declining period, and so they kind of they kind of start using that term, and um, so yeah, it's a middle period, which it is. It's this middle period uh, between ancient times and the modern times. That's why they call it that. And I guess people by the Renaissance started to kind of realize that that this period existed or whatever compared to the old times. And uh, supposedly there was this uh, famous Italian writer who lived in the 1300s uh, who kind of gave it a, a name that everybody knows uh, that they often call the Middle Ages, which is the Dark Ages, the medieval Dark Ages, you know, that. And that's the term that they start calling it 
Uh, and so it's this period where you've got a decline in civilization, uh, which is not as great compared to when it was under the Roman times. Uh, you know, so it takes a long time for, I guess, things to get back to the way it was before, uh, civilization-wise. And a lot of things are lost, like knowledge. A lot of it's lost. And uh, luckily, we do get some of it back uh, through uh, the Arabs, like in the Middle East, uh, and also through the Byzantine Empire that, you know, was lost during the Dark Ages, etc. So uh, the big thing that happened, you know, that caused it all was, of course, the collapse of the Roman Empire. It pretty much was the thing that brought on uh, the Middle Ages uh, in general. And obviously uh, the barbarian invasions, you know, was a was a key thing at really doing it, but also just the loss of certain knowledge that they knew before. Uh, they do subdivide it. That is something true about the Middle Ages. It's often subdivided uh, into different periods. Usually historians break it down into three periods. Early Middle Ages, which we'll talk about first. The High Middle Ages, of course. And then the Late Middle Ages. They usually break them down like that, usually dates-wise. Like early Middle Ages, 500, about 1,000 A.D. or C.E. Uh, middle, high, high Middle Ages, 1,000 to 1,300s. Years, years usually, late late Middle Ages, 13 to 1500s. Uh, sometimes the High Middle Ages call it different names. High Central Middle Ages, I think they sometimes call it late, sometimes called later Middle Ages. And uh, sometimes they even think the later Middle Ages goes up to like the early 1600s or something. It's, it varies by location, like say in Europe. Uh, but up at the time of Shakespeare, they almost consider that part of the part of the Middle Ages, just about like when the Renaissance is kind of still going on. Uh, let's talk about also the different things that influence the medieval period. Uh, you can kind of see it as like a mixture of different cultures. Uh, predominantly, it's really two main cultures that are mixed together. you got the rom rom romantic, romantic culture, like rom the Roman culture uh, that was there before, uh, before the Roman Empire collapsed. It's still around. So you got all this culture. People still think they're Roman even after there's no emperors in the West uh, anymore. But you've got your Germanic culture. The Germans brought their own culture in, their own languages in uh, as well. That mixed with Latin, well, it was already there. And so that's the basis of where you get all these different Romance languages later, like German, you know, Spanish, French, English, uh, Italian, etc. all kind of evolved from a mixture of Latin and Germanic languages uh, that were there. There are other people that come in too, like the Avars and other groups that are outside, Hungarians that are not Huns that are not from there that kind of influence Europe. You've got the Moors in Spain who are Muslim and are a mix of different hereditary background like Arab, Berber, African, et cetera, uh, that are also there. But I think mostly the Roman Germans, Germanic peoples is majority peoples that were in the Middle Ages that you hear about. And then don't forget about the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church is probably the biggest influence on medieval history, really, uh, in general. And part of why we know a lot about medieval Europe is from the church, because the fact that most of the early historians that wrote stuff down were all from the Catholic Church. They were like monks or priests or whatever. You may have heard of Gregory of Tours. I think he was now a saint now in the Catholic Church, you know, Saint Gregory of Tours. Uh, who wrote a history of like the Franks and all that. So that's that's part of why we get uh, Einhard, another Christian monk who wrote about Charlemagne, you know, things like that. So so we get a lot of information, of course, pretty much from, from them. Now, one of the first things I did want to talk about today, of course, I need to get into uh, and discuss the um, this new Europe that's forming, of course, in the West. Uh, you have this particular um, new, yeah, the so-called Merovingian dynasty that comes in. You can see uh, in that slide uh, where the so-called Franks come in, the Franks. Uh, they, they enter Europe, uh, and uh, you have the kingdom of the Franks that forms. Uh, and this is a state, by the way, that was around for something like five centuries or so, five, six centuries uh, that it was around. So it became very powerful uh, throughout um pretty much Western Central Europe uh, influenced it a lot. It, it forced a lot of people to convert to Catholicism because it was a, you know, a Catholic type state uh, that you see 
Uh, and if you remember correctly, the uh, Franks were related back to these Germanic peoples uh, that, that took over Gaul, you know, where France is today. That used to be part of the Roman Empire. They entered there about the 5th century, uh, kind of like mid, mid late 5th century, uh, when the Roman Empire in the West was declining. Uh, and uh, there was a king who was very important named King Clovis. He was considered the founder uh, and, and first king of the Franks uh, that comes to power. Uh, and he would find, found a dynasty uh, that was named after one of his ancestors uh, that was called the Merovingian dynasty. Uh, it's really considered one of the first medieval dynasties uh, that you hear about in Europe. And it was related to this um, one of his one of his grandfathers, uh, who was named Merovich, who may have been some kind of king of the Franks uh, that lived a long time ago. Supposedly, Merovich was one of these kings that fought Attila the Hun uh, at the Battle of um, Catalonian Plains, helped defeat him. Although it's kind of debate about whether he was real or not. I think they say they say he's semi-legendary because they think they think he might not have been a real person uh, or not. Uh, but um, Clovis is very important because Clovis, if you know about it, around 496, converted his whole kingdom to Catholicism. Uh, the Franks were, they were Christian, but they weren't the right type. They were Aryan Christians, that heretical form of Christianity I told you about that the church tried to ban a long time ago, going back to the Council of Nicaea. Uh, they still, it was still around into medieval times. And so he converted his whole, like, you think he converted all of his troops first, and then he convert, converted his whole empire. And uh, they say that uh, part of why he converted uh, was his wife converted him to it. <laughs> so his wife talked him into becoming Catholic. Uh, and then from there, the whole kingdom, you know, became Catholic, and they spread it pretty much after that. That might be why uh, medieval Europe starts around 500, like ran it off, because that's when he converted to Catholicism. So that's maybe why they do that sometimes go. Uh, now, over time, though, uh, the Frankish kings were kind of like these ceremonial type monarchs. They, they really weren't that powerful. And they had these um, Frankish rulers that were called a um, major domo, which means, by the way, mayor of the palace. Uh, and they basically ran like the king's palace. Uh, they ran, ran the household uh, they ran the military. They were like generals that commanded the armies. And uh, there were men like uh, Charles Martel, you hear about in medieval Europe, uh, that kind of comes to the comes to power. He was an example of a major domo uh, that was very big. Uh, and um, uh, major domos are kind of like a cross between a prime minister uh, in like a Japanese shogun, <laughs> that would be about the best way to compare it. So it was like a warlord, uh, kind of that was like a statesman. And um, he was very powerful. He was like almost like the king, really, uh, more than anything. Uh, and um, his real name was uh, Carolus Martellus. Uh, you can see 688 to 741. Uh, and Martellus, a lot of the Franks had these nicknames that they were called. And his nickname was called the Hammer, which is what Martellus means, or Martell. Uh, in English now, and uh, he was known for his military exploits. He was a really good general, like one of the probably the best generals of the Franks uh, that they ever had. And you can see he was credited for stopping Muslim advances into uh, Europe at the time, uh, where he defeated the defeated like what is the Muslims, which are the so-called Moors uh, that were basically trying to invade uh, France at the time. Um, the Moors, uh, and uh, he was famous like the Battle of Tours, uh, which took place on October 10th, uh, 732. And uh, what was going on was that the um, the uh, Islam was spreading uh, from, like I said, North Africa into Europe. Uh, they pushed into Spain at one point. And uh, the Moors, who were like a mixture of uh, like Arab Berber peoples in Africa, uh, eventually conquered uh, the Visigothic Kingdom, which I think happened close to about maybe the 710s uh, CE. And then from there, in the 730s, they began invading into France. They, they thought that maybe they could push Islam into like Western Europe uh, at that point. Uh, and so uh, Martel's forces uh, eventually at what is um, 
the Battle of Tours, which I think has different names, routed their forces and pushed them back into uh, Spain at that point. And so Islam never really spread much into um, what was uh, other parts of Western Europe. And uh, Tours is kind of important. Like Mar what Martel did was important. It kind of cemented Frankish power in Europe. It did. Uh, I think even the the, the uh, Franks would even try to seize part of Spain, uh, like the northern part from him later on a Charlemagne. Uh, and uh, and then it also helped to preserve the Catholic faith. That's, that's something that's kind of important, you know, I guess, at that point. And so Islam is you know spreading elsewhere, but not not in parts of Western Central Europe. It does get in the Eastern Europe, though, because uh, of the Ottoman Empire, though. I do mention about that. All right. So, uh, so yeah, that was Charles Martel. I don't have a picture of his son, but his son's on the bottom. You can see he had a son named Pepin that they had. He went by different names. Pepin the Third, sometimes called Pepin the Short, uh, they had. Uh, as you can see, reigned in the uh, 8th century, 741 to 7, I think it's 78, I think it is actually, is what that should be. But uh, he was uh, very famous uh, for what, what Pepin did. Pepin eventually seized control of the Frankish throne, and he formed his own uh, dynasty, which became known as the Carolingian dynasty. The Franks, the Franks had two dynasties, Merovingian first, and then starting in the 8th century, uh, the Carolingian dynasty reigned up through, like, I want to say the 10th century, uh, that they're around parts of them. And uh, he named the dynasty after his father, which is Carolus Martellus. So that's where the name comes from. The word, the name Carol is where you get the name Charles or Carl from. Um, you know, if you heard that name before, or also if your name is Carlos, you know, that's where the name originated from. And um, the Catholic Church and the pretty much in, in the Franks become very friends with each other. That's one thing that's very, very important at that time. And so the Frank, the Franks are heavily protect, seen as protectors of the Catholic Church. Uh, and one thing that Pepin did that's very famous, he took lands that he had uh, that the, that they controlled in Italy and they gave them to the Catholic Church, so-called donation of Pepin, uh, that it's called and you may have heard of the Papal States, which was an area that was around Italy where the Catholic Church controlled it, uh, where the Vatican City is and all that. Uh, he basically legally gave that to them in 756. And so in return, he was allowed to you know, become king uh, afterwards. So the two kind of go hand in hand. You know, the, the Catholics and the Franks, they kind of work together uh, to make medieval Europe Catholic and all that. And so that's something that's real famous uh, for that time. Uh, then they got Charlemagne, of course, you may have heard of uh, as well, who comes in next, uh, also called Charles the Great, as they had. Uh, Char Charlemagne was, by the way, the uh, son of uh, Pepin. We're talking about Pepin III or Pepin the Short, of course, really the greatest king, of course, of the Franks uh, that you have. His Latin name, you can see, is Carolus Magnus, uh, which was, they call him later Charles the Great, which the French later kind of take it and they slur it, and it becomes Charlemagne. You know, that's one word right there. And uh, Charlemagne is, by the way, considered to be the greatest king of the early Middle Ages. Um, he reigned about, a, about 46 years. That's a long time, from 768 uh, to 814. Um, so, yeah, there's not really too many other kings you could think of that's pretty powerful in medieval Europe. I think maybe Alfred the Great at the time, maybe in England, may have been pretty pretty powerful or whatever. Or maybe in Germany, Otto the I, you can hear of maybe it was a Holy Roman Emperor. So those are kind of names I think kind of think of that might be pretty powerful at that time. And uh, part of why we know so much about um, Charlemagne is because of... Um, this famous uh, Christian priest and monk uh, that was named Einhard. Einhard was the one that wrote a biography about Charlemagne. So that's why we know a lot about him. He had this book that he wrote called Vita Caroli Magni, which means in Latin, the life of Charlemagne. I think sometimes Charles, really the life of Charles, what it means. They say Charlemagne now uh, overall. And um, Einhard uh, was kind of, he wrote a biography uh, that was kind of an emulation 
of uh, the Roman writer um, Suetonius, who wrote like the 12 Caesars uh, or the life of the Caesars and all that, that I've talked about before. And uh, so he actually was uh, uh, supposedly Charlemagne's personal secretary at one point. He knew a lot about Charlemagne. Charlemagne was a great man. He was very, not just very powerful, but huge man. I think he was, they say he was six foot four. I think is what they estimate how tall Charlemagne was. And Charlemagne was not just known for his great conquest, but you know, expanding his empire, but also for converting everybody to, uh, you know, Catholicism uh, in general. Uh, and um, Char Charlemagne uh, had nicknames that they called him, which I'll kind of mention about, uh, which is kind of true. I think he had three names besides Charles the Great. The other two names he was sometimes called by a lot of Christians was Iron Charles. Uh, yeah, Iron, believe it or not, Iron Charles. And also they called him sometimes the right arm of God. Uh, this is because of the fact that Charlemagne, like I said, was involved in converting a lot of people to Christianity. Uh, he also built a lot of churches and cathedrals uh, throughout his empire. Uh, he was also a patron of the arts. He tried to bring back some kind of arts and literature in medieval times. Uh, he tried to, you know, value education. Uh, I suppose he could speak Latin or write in Latin uh, as well. Uh, so, so yeah, he was somewhat educated, but mostly through tutors and things like that, uh, Charlemagne. So really considered to be one of the greatest, greatest rulers uh, and, um, of that time. Uh, here's a kind of a map showing you his empire, uh, which kind of is different maps that I guess they show today. Uh, but over time, what ends up happening uh, is that Charlemagne uh, takes this Christian empire that he has and he forms it into what is called later the so-called Carolingian Empire, you know, named after uh, his dynasty. Uh, and um, you can see the empire stretches like from like northern Spain uh, into most of France. It goes up into northern Germany where Saxony is down to Bavaria, and then at one point he controlled most of Italy as well. So it mostly is, it is an empire that was in mostly Western and Central Central Europe. And I guess outside of Britain and Spain, those are the areas that he, he controlled uh, as, as a massive empire. And this is an empire, by the way, that rivaled um, what is basically the Byzantine or Eastern Roman Empire uh, that was in the East. Uh, by the way, it was centered around an area called Austrasia, which is kind of like in the western part of France, Belgium, and western Germany. It's kind of an area uh, which is like, um, if you go to this map here, it's about like in this area here. That's Austrasia, which is right here. In the middle, there's a capital called Aachen, which is now in western Germany. And that was where he ruled from as an actual ruler of this empire. So it's not Paris or Berlin or some other major city you hear about later that's, or Rome even, uh, by the way, uh, that's in there. And yeah, at first he was a king. That's that's true about, about Charlemagne. He was a king originally, uh, but uh, if you know about it, he was actually crowned by the Pope uh, as emperor, which the tradition is that he was crowned on Christmas Day, 800, uh, the year 800 CE or AD. Uh, and uh, the Pope at the time was Pope Leo III. He crowned him. Suppose he crept up behind him and put the crown on his head, but I, don't, I think it was all just kind of a ceremony that was basically planned. But basically the Catholic Church at that point uh, basically crowned him King of King of the Romans, I think is the title. Some people say Emperor of the Romans uh, at that point. And so the Catholic Church is that this idea is trying to lay this idea of a new kind of Christian empire that's forming uh, that's kind of similar uh, to the Byzantine Empire that's in the East. So it's this new Western Roman Empire. That's the idea, I guess, of what they were trying to do uh, with the Carolingian Empire uh, that was forming. Uh, but it was really a Germanic uh, empire, you know, the Franks, that was kind of an emulation of the, the Western Roman Empire. But it fell apart, you know, about that after, after he died. Uh, Charlemagne is very important, by the way. He's the father of Europe. I think that's what, something that they all can talk about uh, with, of course, his empire and what he did for Europe. Uh, you can see he actually helped to create two states afterwards that formed later, which were France in the West and then Germany in, in, in Central Europe. 
uh, as a whole in Germany. And Germany, by the way, later became whole, the Holy Roman Empire, which was the nickname they called the Middle Ages, which suppose he founded, you know, Charlemagne, uh, more or less. But like I said, Charlemagne was known for like building a lot of churches. Uh, there's the famous cathedral at Aachen. Uh, you can see here uh, that he was known for uh, building at one point, which was, by the way, bombed or more, too. And I think they rebuilt it. Uh, that's what it looks like now. And uh, that's where actually Charlemagne's buried inside of it, uh, which, of course, with that. So he did build he did build a lot of churches and things like that uh, throughout throughout the empire. Uh, now, after Charlemagne died, uh, what happened afterwards was his empire broke up uh, afterwards. That's one thing that, of course, occurred. And uh, he had a son named Louis the Pious that actually reigned from 814 up to like close to about 840, uh, roughly. He was called Pious because he was very, very Catholic. Uh, and uh, anyway, uh, he's really the last major ruler that they had. They only had like two major rulers, him and his son, uh, Lewis. That's why Lewis is kind of popular too, because of him and Clovis. Clovis is also the Latin name for Louis or Lewis. Uh, and um, what happened afterwards was that the Carolingian Empire collapsed due to civil war. They had this thing called the Carolingian Civil War uh, that happened about 840 to about 843. And uh, Lewis had all these sons, uh, which you see down there. I think he had four at one point, but three named Lothair, Pepin, and Lewis the German all began fighting over the empire. Each wanted a piece of it, and they had want to share it or have one rule. Uh, and so over time, what happened in the end uh, was the empire was broken up uh, in 843. There's a very famous treaty you need to know about that's well known today. Uh, it's called the Treaty of Verdun uh, that was signed between them uh, in 843. And what it did was it divided up the um, the, the kingdom of the Franks, the empire, the Carolingian empire, uh, into three states, uh, which of course were Western Francia, Middle Francia, and Eastern Francia, because that's actually what they called it a lot of times. The actual Carolingian empire was called Francia. That was the original name. Uh, and so what's going to happen, uh, because the fact that, you know, it gets divided up, that's what happens to Europe. Europe gets divided up into all these different separate states. And if you ever wonder why all these different states exist throughout Europe, why they're all divided and not like one big state, it's all because of that treaty, uh, more or less, and other treaties that come later that they have. And um, yeah, you get like this deal where, you know, you get Western Francia. That's where you get France. That's France, pretty much the kingdom of France will merge right there. Eastern France will be like Germany. Uh, what they call the Holy Roman Empire, of course, that Charlemagne supposedly founded. And then Middle France is where you get all these other states, Italy, the Netherlands, Belgium, Switzerland, uh, all that kind of break break away, you know, right there over time. And so that's that's the whole reason for that. So who knows, like, what would have happened, you know, if, uh, you know, if Charlemagne would have lived uh, and his empire would have, you know, continued uh, after that, uh, you know, if, it's, if it would have stayed together, you know, it may have been, you know, what could have happened with that, uh, but nobody knows. So, but uh, you do have this period comes in later. I'll kind of be talking about next week. Uh, you have the Viking age uh, where the Vikings start entering Europe. They invade Europe and conquer parts of it. So as the Carolingian empires, you know, fading uh, this particular empires uh, coming in at that point. And uh, I'll talk about the major events uh, that are in the high middle ages. You know, you got the, got the Viking period. Uh, you've got the Crusades uh, that comes in as well. Uh, also, you've got the uh, invasion of the Mongols. The Mongols kind of hit Asia uh, in Eastern Europe uh, as well. So I'll kind of get into also talk about that uh, as well next week. So um, that's it pretty much lecture wise today. Uh, next week, like I said, I'll kind of continue and wrap up uh, whatever I can uh, of course, on the Middle Ages. So I, I expect I'll probably have at least two more lectures, uh, part two and a part three on the Middle Ages uh, that I'll have later. Uh, so so anyway, I hope you all have a great rest of the week and weekend coming up. Uh, don't forget, of course, you have some new assignments. I've got, I got, I got one up there I know I've got on the later Roman Empire. Make sure, of course, you wrap up on that, of course, assignment. If you have any comments, questions later, of course, about this lecture or previous lectures, let me know, of course, uh, on my, uh, through my YouTube channel. 
And that's it pretty much uh, for today. I uh, hope y'all, like I said, have a great weekend, of course, coming up. So y'all take, of course, take care.